from the University of Ottawa, who will talk about computational model of Alzheimer's disease in astrocytic microdomains. So if Anna, if you want to share your screen and your presentation, yeah. we can put yeah. you, you in the spotlight. Uh, just a moment. Just have to start my slide. Yeah, I hope uh, everyone can see my first slide. Yes, perfect. So I'll stop yeah. my video and unmute myself. Okay, uh, hi everyone. And it's uh, really a pleasure to uh, discuss my work, um, computational work, where we try to understand uh, signaling, associated signaling uh, at a single compartment um, uh, and sharing um, a synapse. Uh, so this work was primarily uh, done at uh, ISER, uh, the Indian Institute of Science and Education, um, uh, at, uh, Research and Education in India, and supervised by uh, Suhita Nathkarni. And currently, I am uh, at the University of Ottawa. Um, okay, so without further ado, um, so uh, I don't think this audience uh, needs an introduction for uh, suicides. Uh, we already heard a lot of nice talks. Um, uh, so just to uh, just to uh, just for just for the talk, I, we know that associates branch out into very fine uh, uh, processes that are that are ensheathing a majority of the synapses in the cort in the cortex. We also know that these um, uh, processes express uh, uh, several membrane receptors, and uh, uh, most importantly, we know that they express uh, the metabotropic glutamate receptors. We know that these processes uh, have uh, microdomains. Uh, these microdomains have ER in them, and this few studies. I would also mention a few studies uh, in the coming slides. And uh, we know that these processes, and most importantly, that they display um, uh, local calcium activity, uh, and which are uh, which, which we know already from several experimental studies that they can be uh, fast and uh, high amplitude. Uh, so um, we also have several studies showing that these uh, astrocytes. Um, are equipped with uh, most of the missionaries that, are, that we know from, uh, from the neurons that are required for um, calcium-dependent exodose, uh, vascular release. Uh, and of course, and that's going to be also one of the main um, uh, uh, motivation for us to, uh, uh, to, to develop a model for a society uh, compartment that is uh, just right at the synapse. And uh, just to uh, just to um, just to illustrate what I was said, and this is a recent study from Andreas Vol Andrea Volterra's lab by Erika Bindosi, it clearly demonstrates that uh, associated compartments um, are are uh, are uh, do, do respond to axonal stimulation. So even a single single axonal stimulations uh, are picked up uh, are are, um, as, uh, are evoke uh, uh, decent calcium signals in associated compartments. Uh, so we also know that we, we uh, although we know a lot of compartmentalization about, about compartmentalization of calcium in spines from uh, from from uh, great work by uh, um, um, by several people, um, we, there is very little understanding about the compartmentalization in in the fine processes of astrocytes. But we already know, starting from the uh, from mGluR receptors, uh, we know that mGluR receptors are not present everywhere. They are uh, very uh, localized more close to the processes that are around synapses, and 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 also their diffusion is limited uh, uh, by molecular players that limit the, the diffusion of these receptors close to the soma. We also know that these uh, processes next to the um, spines have uh, a, a decent amount of ER, and uh, they are they seem to be specifically located near the PSD containing regions. So. Uh, Again, uh, showing that uh, these processes next to the spine, next to the spines, might be fully equipped with the uh, calcium stores to uh, to generate the local calcium events. An important thing that we also noticed that there's uh, this very puncti uh, punctate staining of IP3 IP3 uh, two receptors that we know from experimental studies, and so this uh, also um, uh, led us to uh, uh, think about that this uh, signaling and associated processes can be very stochastic because they are mediated by a small cluster of IP3 receptors. Uh, so, uh, so there is a clear uh, um, uh, uh, need for us to look uh, particularly at a single uh, compartment uh, that is right at the spine, at the, at the synapse, uh, 
and uh, what how does the signaling evolve at this uh, very tight cellular space uh, of course we we are not yet there in our experimental uh, tools to really look at uh, signaling at this level and so a computational model would be a, a greatly advantageous for us to uh, to understand uh, what's going on and also to make predictions that can be tested in by future ex experiments. So I will just uh, briefly go over the governing equations that we have in the model. Uh, so we have uh, included most of the uh, primary calcium uh, regulating components, uh, both in the cytosol and the ER, uh, as well as the, uh, both calcium dependent and independent ways of IP3 generation uh, pathways. Um, uh, specifically, I would just to mention the, the fact that we have a, um, uh, uh, we have um, uh, we have included a stochastic description of calcium signaling, and that's yeah, that's we find important uh, that because the fact that we have a small cluster of IP3 receptors at these processes, and it is uh, by using deterministic equation doesn't really capture what's going on at its single compartment level. So we used a, a model that was previously developed from Shuai and Peter Jung, where they were trying to model um, uh, calcium puffs uh, from cells like astrocytes, and they have clearly demonstrated that this is very important to take into account. And so uh, basically in the in the IP3 receptor equation, as you can see here, uh, there is, um, I don't know if I can use my pointer. Um, can you see my pointer? Uh, not sure. We see the mouse, uh, yes. or at least I see okay. the mouse. Okay, perfect. So this is a, a, a Gaussian white noise, um, uh, uh, zero mean goes in white noise, and that really is equivalent to the to uh, to making to using a Markovian approach to model the channel uh, dynamics. So I will just uh, straight away uh, go into the results. Um, so here is a here is an example of um, uh, of the response from the compartment with a single um, single vesicular release. So this uh, the kinetic the profile of this vesicular release um, uh, it, it captures the 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 profile of the spillover glutamate. Uh, just around the uh, around the synapses, where we know that that's what been sensed by the associated compartments, and uh, as you can see, the IP3 level uh, just doesn't go much. It's very only a top, uh, only about a 10, 15 nanomolars. And what is interesting is the calcium signaling that is uh, uh, that is mediated by this single uh, glutamate vesicle is is much more uh, noisy. As you can see, there are uh, also some. This is just a few few uh, trials of simulations overlaid. You can see high amplitude as well as very low amplitude events. Uh, if you average them, you don't see much of a change in calcium. But what's important is this this variability in calcium. That's uh, that's one of the key factor that plays a role. That's what we think, and uh, so that's really is captured by uh, our stochastic description of calcium signaling. And this is uh, just to uh, uh, just to again to uh, show you an example of how does the model responds to a more uh, prolonged but stronger uh, stimul stimulant. So in this case, we use DHPG. Uh, with, uh, of 100 micromolars and uh, lasting for two seconds. And, and specifically, we use this stimulation because a lot of experimental um, studies we, we know already where we could validate our model with. And what you can see here is that uh, this strong stimul uh, strong uh, um, uh, mglur mediated response evokes very high calcium amplitudes. And this amplitude is primarily uh, from the ER stores. And you can also see that the ER uh, gets depleted uh, following this very uh, intense stimulation and takes tens of seconds to uh, uh, to fill back. Um, and um, um, so there is an interesting study uh, done uh, was that was published a few uh, uh, years ago, where um, uh, from uh, Julie Marchland from Paul Abbasi's lab, it was looking at um, uh, both calcium signaling and and uh, uh, exo uh, exocytosis at single at single uh, compartment level. Uh, close to the uh, synapses. And uh, what we know from the study is that this calcium rises at single compartment can be quite fast and they are in the order of hundreds of milliseconds and um, uh, they are uh, also very stochastic. So as you can see here on the, on the left side, uh, even applying for the DHPG, you have like small events that are coming up which are highly stochastic in nature and they have a very, um, a very uh, fast uh, dynamics. Uh, so we uh, we uh, we first tried to validate our model with uh, the experimental finding from this study, and so this is the experimental um, uh, uh, from the from the from the paper I just discussed, and uh, uh, where uh, there's a histogram of uh, events uh, pulled from a, a, a large number of processes, uh, and the, uh, the, the histogram clearly shows an exponential decay of uh, calcium events as the stimulus was applied for two seconds. And we use the same protocol to uh, to mimic this experiment, and we also see that in our model we was able to reliably capture this um, uh, histogram. 
these uh, statistics. And uh, so our model was able to account for close to 90 percentage of, uh, of the events uh, that was triggered by a single DHB uh, application. Okay, so uh, armed with the model that we think is, is reliable enough uh, to capture the calcium signaling from a single compartment, we next wanted to um, uh, model glial transmission. And that's a pretty um, uh, difficult uh, challenge because we know we don't know of, about any anything much about how to model glial transmission in a physiologically realistic manner. But we have a lot of evidence, uh, experiment evidence from the last couple of years or last um, decade also that there is uh, this clearly these processes are equipped with all the necessary machineries for uh, glial transmission in a calcium dependent manner. Uh, the first thing that we we, uh, we went on to um, was to really understand what kind of calcium sensors. So we know that synaptotagmines are the main are the calcium sensors that are responsible for sensing the calcium and mediating a fusion. And uh, of, the, of the roughly 13 types of synaptotagmines that we know so far, and we know that at least synaptotagmine 4 and 7 are clearly uh, present in astrocytes. There are also synaptotagmine 5 is also been shown, but we, we in this study, we clearly focus on 4 and 7 for reasons that I will come to the next slide. And uh, separately, we also know that these uh, um, associated compartments are uh, does exocytosis in both in kiss and run and full fusion mode. So as, as, as most of us know, kiss and run is like a very transient fusion of the, of the vesicle to the membrane. Uh, uh, we are still not sure how much of the cargo it actually dumps by this fusion, but it is also indication that it, even though it is a very transient fusion, it, it mostly dumps uh, most of the cargo of the vesicle. Uh, in, in opposite, the full fusion events are mostly involved like a, a complete fusion of the, of the, of the membrane of the, of the vascular membrane into the uh, into the plasma membrane, so there is clearly uh, uh, like a complete fusion, and then an endocytosis uh, that uh, recaptures the vesicle back. Um, so if we uh, the first uh, the first uh, challenge for us was to uh, decide on which synaptotagmines will participate on what kind of uh, fusion process. Uh, for that, we uh, we looked into a previous study from Marco Kraft. Uh, uh, He's, uh, he was monitoring uh, uh, exocytosis using capacitance changes. And we know that capacitance changes uh, is primarily is a detector of full fusions because they need uh, the complete fusion of the membrane to capture the change in the capacitance uh, due to the difference in the area of the cell membrane. And, and uh, this, uh, his studies clearly uh, showed us that, uh, um, that feeding uh, with a Hill equation uh, showed that there is a Hill coefficient of, of five, meaning that there is, might be at least five calcium ions are binding to the sensor and uh, affinity of roughly around 20 uh, micromoles. Uh, okay, so then um, uh, separately, we know also from other studies that the different, as most of synaptotagmines have two uh, calcium binding domains, and this is the C2A and C2B. And uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a, few, uh, a pre previous study, we know that the 2A and 2B have separate, uh, separately mediate kiss and run and full fusion. And specifically, 2A is being shown to be uh, important for C, uh, uh, kiss and run, while C2B is important for uh, full fusion. And what we know is that uh, in the synaptotype in 4, which we know clearly is present in exercise, does lack a C2B domain, meaning that this uh, synaptotype in 4 is unable to um, uh, mediate full fusions because it doesn't have the C2B domain. Uh, separately, we also know that synaptotagmin 7 has also other functions uh, apart from uh, um, apart from mediating calcium release, uh, vesicular release, uh, but most importantly, it's important for uh, the endocytosis of vesicles. So without synaptotagmin 7, it would be very hard for vesicles to be recycled. So this gives us another handle that we will definitely has to have synaptotagmin 7. And of course, we also know that uh, synaptotagmin 4 is also involved. So we uh, therefore, um, uh, came up with a uh, kinetic scheme for synaptotagmin 4 and synaptotagmin 7 that independently mediate kiss and run and full fusion exocytosis. The next, uh, the next important uh, step for us was to uh, figure out how many vesicles do these processes in the single compartment uh, might have. Uh, we know from EM studies that um, there is not much vesicles present at uh, just, uh, just right in the plasma membrane, there are very few vesicles. But we weren't happy with just go for one study. But what we did was that we um, we went to the we went back to the literature and collected a whole lot of uh, studies that have used uh, different agonists. And 
uh, from different labs that have actually monitored um, gliotransmission in different ways. And so there we find a remarkable, so we captured those data directly from the, from the, from the published manuscripts. We find there's a remarkable similarity with, uh, respective of what the agonist that was used to stimulate gliotransmission. And uh, so it seems like most, uh, most of the, and you can see that the release rate of the, 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 the release the release rate is, is, is declining even when the agonist is still applied, uh, clearly indicating that there is definitely a depletion of vesicles happening by this uh, very, uh, very strong stimulation. And when we did a cumulative uh, um, histogram, it was clear that most of the vesicles get exocytosis within a few uh, uh, milliseconds right after the uh, presentation of the stimulus. And uh, we also uh, found that this and the number of vesicles seems to be uh, uh, in par with the number of uh, separate domains that were sampled to generate this statistic. So armed with this knowledge, we, uh, we, we, uh, we, we went on to create a detailed biophysical framework that, in, that took into account of all this information from different studies and uh, the kind of synaptotactins that we think uh, might be present and, and what kind of fusions they might um, trigger. We sort of, and we also uh, modeled a detailed framework for, um, uh, for endocytosis. Uh, uh, which is also coming from uh, the parameters that are coming from different studies that have actually independently carried out, uh, 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 try to understand uh, vesicle recycling in, in astrocytes. Okay, so um, uh, uh, because of the time limitation, I won't go into detail about our, about, uh, about on our results, but just to uh, just to show here that our our release, our model for the clear transmission uh, seems to be not too bad, and compare when 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 compared with the uh, with the experimental results. So you can see that the release, uh, the statistic of the of our release model that accounting for um, uh, about 200 processes. So uh, we know from the experimental, the experimental study that we used to compare, sampled roughly to uh, 400 uh, separate micro domains uh, to, to generate the histogram. So uh, considering that these domains might be uh, independent, we model, we, we simulated 400 independent trials uh, because I was a single compartment model, we uh, we just uh, we just model 400 independent trials, and then we pull data from all these 400 trials to compare our model with the experiment. And it seems that it's a it's a fair good um, match between our the the release uh, events generated from the model uh, and the experiments. Uh, of course, uh, the because because I was a computation model, we we were able to um, uh, characterize more on the release events, and you can see that the, the, the synaptic I mean, four activated release is very fast upon uh, presentation of the DHPG, while the slow asynchronous fusions that are mediated by uh, synaptic I mean, seven are uh, um, happens much more diffuse and more asynchronous. Also, also see here is that the the docked vesicles get depleted very fast while after the presentation of the stimulus. While there's also mobile vesicles that are actually uh, part of the endocytosis pathway, they starts to build up after the after a short after a while the stimulus presentation, and that is they participate in the in, in the in and finally they this, these mobile vesicles get docked and are ready for the release. And uh, so I, I will also uh, next I will uh, uh, go into the uh, into the model that we have made to understand what's happening in in uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease. And we know from several uh, studies that uh, calcium signaling in exercise is clearly altered by uh, amyloid, amyloid uh, deposition. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, however, we not very really sure the mechanisms that, that cause this uh, dysregulation in necessary calcium. And separately, we know from in vitro studies that amyloid beta is a strong modulator of a uh, couple of mechanisms, uh, especially m signaling is enhanced uh, when exposed to amyloid in, uh, in necessary cultures. Uh, separately, we also know that PMC activity is strongly inhibited by uh, amyloid beta. So taking into account of these uh, two molecular mechanisms, we created a model for a society, a societies that probably um, uh, are how they are, uh, how the calcium signaling machinery is altered by uh, amyloid beta ac uh, accumulation. So here's, uh, is, uh, here you have one model for the MGLUR phenotype, which uh, where we have a different uh, uh, um, uh, uh, signaling of the MGLUA, especially there is a higher um, uh, higher KD um, uh, higher KD and the shift of the the dose response uh, when, when you apply the DHPG at different concentrations uh, similarly we can also see a shift in the in the calcium um, in the PMCA functionality meaning that in the P, uh, there is inhibition of PMCA uh, which uh, we try to capture from what we know from experimental studies 
So uh, modeling these two uh, phenotypes, we are able to see that there is clearly the calcium signaling is completely altered in these two um, in these two uh, in, with these two mechanisms. As you can see, compared to control, the mGlobar uh, astrocytes clearly have more higher calcium events, um, as well as a higher rate of calcium events when stimulated with with glutamate at 10 hertz for 30 seconds. And uh, what's interesting also that we see spontaneous calcium events um, that is generated when we have PMCA, uh, altered PMCA functionality in these astrocytes. Uh, so we characterize this, uh, uh, we also see that uh, um, there is also changes in glial transmission uh, in, in these uh, different kinds of astrocytes that capture the um, uh, mechanisms of uh, amyloid beta accumulation. Uh, especially what you see here is that more, there's a more releases. So you can see the red is the kiss and burn release and the blue is uh, the full fusion releases and both kiss and run and full fusion release are enhanced but we also have a lot of spontaneous releases coming up uh, because there's also a lot of spontaneous calcium uh, events that are generated so uh, looking into this uh, this uh, sort of to characterize this thing what we uh, what we see is that there is a clear flattening of the kiss and run, kiss and run response unlike the control scenario where there is a clear increase which shows a clear dynamic range uh, with different stimulation of glutamate uh, however, we see that there is no such uh, the dynamic range is completely absent in uh, in in, in associate with the altered PMCA function. Uh, uh, we we next uh, also look into synchrony because we know from other studies that calcium synchrony is clearly enhanced in uh, astrocytes uh, in in in, uh, in different AD models, animal models. Uh, we also see that there is a synchrony, but the synchrony is not uh, is, is is different. So especially we see that the calcium synchrony is higher uh, when you have PMC abnormalities, especially when you stimulate at low frequencies. But however, when you stimulate the associate at, at medium frequencies, ranging from uh, around 10 hertz, we see that there is also we see that there is also a higher frequency, a high, higher synchrony of calcium events. Uh, uh, however, that synchrony sort of drops back uh, when you when you stimulate the higher frequencies. So at low at uh, mid range of frequencies, you clearly see that there is an increased uh, synchrony of calcium events across uh, simulation trials. Uh, lastly, we also look into the temporal relationship between uh, calcium signaling and glial transmission because that's we know is a central part if astrocyte has to play a, a role in information processing across the synapse. So what we looked here was to uh, was the synchrony? Was it how? How? What is the lag time between a single calcium event and the associated glial transmission? And we see that in the control associate, there is a very high correlation of uh, time of glare, of calcium signaling, calcium events, and the associated glial transmission, which which is which breaks down at higher stimulation frequencies. Meaning that when you stimulate the associate at higher frequencies, they are not able to match up. Uh, with the calcium signaling and the uh, associated glial transmission, but even uh, but in, in in the exercise which have impaired PMCA mechanisms, we see that this this uh, correlation is uh, is is diminished even at lower frequencies, and so that you can clearly see that when you have PMC abnormalities, there is a very clear reduction in the correlation between calcium signaling and release. And it turns out that it is actually mediated by the depletion of docked vesicles. So what happens is that for synchrony is uh, is very important uh, for the the kiss and run mechanisms to be uh, to be active because that's more synchronous to the calcium uh, uh, calcium rises. And what 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 we see is that there's a shift in the in the in, in the preferred uh, exocytosis pathway from kiss and run to full fusion exocytosis pathway. While we know that the full fusion is not synchronous uh, to the calcium release mechanisms. So this uh, attributes to the shift uh, that we see in the in the correlation between calcium signaling and glial transmission. So I would uh, I would uh, uh, because of the time I would uh, summarize my talk here and basically I have shown you a framework that you have developed that captured uh, the calcium signaling and glial transmission release and we are able to uh, uh, we are able to validate our uh, results with some of the experimental finding and, and we see a decent match. And uh, we next try to uh, understand what's happening uh, in the case of Alzheimer's disease using a known, uh, our known understanding about how ABDA, accumulation of ABDA might change some of the molecular machineries in, in astrocytes. And uh, so our model is able to uh, replicate some of the findings that we already know that uh, astrocytes exercise get more synchronous uh, in, in, when, when they are when exposed to amyloid beta. And we also predict that uh, apart from the increase in synchrony, we also might have a, a, an impairment in the precision of uh, uh, the temporal precision between calcium and release events. Uh, I would like to thank uh, um, uh, my, my advisor and the, and the lab members of, uh, and also the fundings that I've received to complete this project. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anup.
So are there any questions um, from, the, from the audience? If you have one, you can write question in the chat. We can give you voice or you can text it for I can start for a minute. So, ah, okay, no, we have a question from, from Kerstin. So sh you can mute yourself actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. I was just wondering, so um, I'm not uh, like 100% sure, um, is uh, the, um, the vesicular release, is this basically uh, homogeneously distributed throughout the astrocytes or are there particular re uh, regions uh, where this actually happens? Because uh, like it's, I'm asking because you, are, you have said that um, you uh, used a, a single compartment model and would you expect any changes uh, if this is the case, what I was asking? Yeah, that's a, it's a really great question. Uh, uh, of course, our model is a single compartment, as you, all, you already said, and uh, we are spatially agnostic. Uh, however, um, we know that at, at, given the, the spatial constraints of a single compartment, um, uh, we, uh, the, uh, we, there might be some difference if, we, if, we, if, one is able to, if one is able to do a more detailed modeling of uh, taking the space into consideration. Uh, but um, yeah, but, but, but given that they don't have that many vesicles uh, that are anchored, we, we think that our, our description should be comparable in the, in the case, because if there are multiple vesicles, then one can imagine that the space is definitely a, a constraint. But here, uh, we are on, we are in, in, in the model that we have presented here, we only have a single vesicle in a, in a single process. So there is, uh, so that for that reason, we didn't need to consider space into that much of detail. Um, uh, yeah, of course, when you have more vesicles than uh, where they are docked and, uh, and the whole dynamics of calcium at different subcellular spaces might be, uh, might, be, uh, might be important to take into account. Okay, thanks a lot. And so, okay, so I can continue with my question. So um, uh, you said that your model is a single compartment. So my question is, because I don't know much about Alzheimer's disease, um, do you how do you took into consideration the ER uh, ratio or spatial distribution in the micro domains and how affect the Alzheimer disease uh, different distributions of ER? Right. Yeah. So I mean, definitely we took a lot of time to uh, into the ER uh, thing. Uh, uh, definitely ER is one of the main is is the main source of calcium, or for us is the only source only calcium store through which the calcium is released. And, uh, and 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 uh, so one thing one thing that we thought about a lot was the amount of ER in in a compartment. So uh, the, which would be uh, it could be captured by the volume ratio between the cytosol and the ER. And uh, we we went to a lot of literature to really understand what's going on. What would be the right uh, ratio volume ratio of the ER versus cytosol? And uh, so it, it turns out that the when you have a glial transmission, tra transmission from a particular, uh, especially at the compartments that are near the synapses, there seems to be a higher amount of ER in them. And that is, in, that is uh, we have those indications from a few studies. And also there are a few studies that particularly look into uh, the association between PSD and the ER, lo ER localization in exercise. There seems to be a very good correlation. So there seems to be a lot of ER in the, in the processes that are very near the synapses. So to take into account of that, we, uh, we, we obviously have a higher volume of uh, the ER to a higher ER to a cytosol volume ratio. And the other thing was that the concentration of calcium in the ER, of course, a lot of uh, studies uh, uh, before, uh, they didn't take into account that the ER has much higher calcium concentration than we usually thought, that we know that the ER has uh, around the order of 250 micromolars of calcium. So uh, we took both of these factors into consideration uh, in developing our models, uh, yeah. So in our case, uh, the ER factor is captured by the volume ratio because it's a single compartment model. Uh, we don't have a detailed uh, uh, space uh, of the ER morphology inside the cytoplasm. And in this case, our, our model captures that uh, ER dominance by using the ER to uh, set a solid volume fraction. Okay, I see, thanks. Uh, so we have one more question from Daniel. Uh, if it's a fast one, you can- it, it's, it's fast. So the question okay. is, you spent all this time on, on PMCA alterations. What about circa, if the ER is so important? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we, we didn't really play with circa that much. Uh, 
uh, obviously there are a lot of other things that we could uh, we could definitely try and tweak and see how much they have they might influence the calcium signaling but we stick to uh, some very known uh, uh, um, um, experimental evidences to uh, on what factors to tweak so we know uh, um, that from a lot of evidence that m is definitely altered which is there's also increased expression of m in human tissues uh, from Alzheimer's patients. And uh, separately, we also know that PMC signaling seems to be also altered. And this is very clear from in vitro studies that when you dump uh, A-beta on, uh, on, uh, on cell cultures, uh, and you can see that there's a clear change in the PMCF function. And um, uh, we didn't come across uh, some uh, any clear evidence for CERCAS. So that's the reason why I, we didn't really play with CERCAS, but I'm very sure that the circus, if it is affected, they will definitely have a major role in changing the signaling uh, at these compartments. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, sorry, Carlos, keep your question for the discussion later um, because we now need to move uh, to the next speaker. Um, so, the next Once speaker again, is uh, Renan. No, th sorry. thank you to you. Sorry. <laughs> And see you later for the discussion, actually. Um, so the next speaker is Renaud Jolivet from the University of Genève. And he will talk about modeling and analyzing neuron astrocytes, metabolic interactions. So I'll give the stage to you and I'm mute and stop my video. Thanks. Can you hear me and see the slides? Yes. Yeah, perfect. All right. So. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present our work. Um, and uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about a slightly different topic uh, that I think has not really been addressed uh, so far in the in the workshop, uh, and and focus really on um, uh, neuron astrocyte interactions in the in the framework of. Um, metabolic interactions and by metabolism I mean specifically uh, energy metabolism and so why are we interested by uh, energetic considerations in, in the brain and I think this is uh, illustrated here on this uh, on this picture on the left um, this is the uh, torso of a, a male a human male who's received uh, f18 fluoro dioxide glucose which uh, reports glucose utilization and you can see that the brain is very strongly labeled indicating uh, uh, rather high energy consumption for the brain tissue. Now if you are uh, in this field you've probably already seen um, a thousand versions of, the, of that uh, statement that the brain accounts for about two percent of the total body weight but about 20 percent of the whole body glucose utilization and so it's a rather uh, expensive organ from your body's perspective. Um, and not only is it expensive to uh, operate as an adult, but uh, if you look at data from um, uh, developmental data from like in this great study by Kuzawa and colleagues, um, you can see that at around age five, um, the brain takes up 70 to 80% of the glucose that is being consumed by the body. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily indicate uh, only energy consumption for, for signaling because there is extensive uh, plastic reorganization of the tissue at that age, but it, it gives you a sense of um, just uh, uh, how expensive the, the brain is as an organ to, to basically produce and then to operate later on in adult life. And in that study, it eventually plateaus down at 19% in adults. And so uh, this is... Um, uh, interesting to us for a number of reasons. One is that uh, this then uh, naturally connects to clinical imaging modalities like positive emission tomography and, and bold fMRI because these do not report um, neuronal activity per se, but metabolic correlates of neuronal activity. Um, this is also important in, a, in clinical settings because uh, there is a, a vast number of pathologies uh, where people have reported abnormal brain energy metabolism. Um, and not to say that this is the trigger for this disease, but it at, it at least is a component of it. And then finally, um, I mean, this is probably uh, uh, important for computing aspects as well. Um, and if you talk uh, to people who, for instance, manufacture computing devices or work in in, we do neuromorphic engineering, um, they, will, they, they are really interested by these energetic questions uh, because of course, from the, in the manufacturing world, the, the, the power consumption of a device is a significant concern always. And they are sometimes a bit puzzled that neuroscientists don't spend more time on these energetic questions. And to try to uh, give you a sense that maybe this is an interesting question also from a computing side, I will 
make a, a little detour before coming back to astrocytes and show you this. So this is uh, experiments and computational models that uh, we've published together with Julia Harris when I was working in London, where we looked at information flow in the visual pathway and, uh, in, and also uh, energy cons uh, co the concomitant energy consumption uh, that goes together with this uh, information flow. And so what we did is to uh, look at um, spike trains uh, basically trans, uh, um, propagated from retinal ganglion cells to thalamic relay cells and to further to the uh, layer four spiny stellate cells in the visual cortex. And we manipulated in the case of the graph that you see on the right, we manipulated the conductance of that synapse that is labeled red uh, in, the, in the circuit on the, on the left. Um, and we, record, we used information theory to basically assess how much information is flowing through that synapse. And we also used uh, basic biophysics uh, and, and electrophysiological recordings to measure um, how much uh, energy is being consumed. And so, so what we found out is that um, the synapses, uh, and we have similar results for the layer four spiny stellate cell synapse, uh, they are not tuned uh, physiologically to maximize information flow, uh, which would be to maximize the amount of uh, or the, the bits of information per second that flow through the synapse, but rather they maximize uh, the bits per ATP. So they, max, they optimize the ratio between information transfer and energy consumption. And so this, the, the idea that, um, uh, I mean, it's naive, to see, what I wanna say is that it's naive to think that, uh, you know, you can uh, neural networks, biological neural networks can operate with unlimited uh, energy supply. And so apparently, uh, at least it's a, it's a design principle at some, of sign, at some synapses uh, that they, you find, these, you see this trade-off experimentally between um, the capacity to, to transfer information across um, uh, and and the, the concomitant energy consumption. And so in more recent work with my postdoc Dmitro Gritsky, we've been looking at these questions at, in artificial neural networks. And um, so we are looking at uh, artificial neural networks that operate under energetic constraints. Uh, there were a number of other studies that have been published recently or presented at this conference actually um, uh, on that question. And, and what we found is, um, that you can you can derive uh, synaptic learning worlds that are uh, reminiscent of what you uh, observe biologically, but uh, they tend to be uh, at least in our work so-called three-factor rules. So they include a term that is uh, the activity of the presynaptic neuron. Uh, they include a term that is the activity of the postsynaptic neuron, and they all, they also include a third factor which seems to you you could interpret as some kind of a global monitoring of the overall activity in the in the neural network and so if you try to think what kind of uh, component of brain tissue could perform this task of monitoring the overall activity um, and play a role uh, especially in the context of energy metabolism of course uh, um, astrocytes seem to be the most obvious suspects and this is because uh, astrocytes uh, have been est established for a long time to metabolically support neurons. And you can see an example of that here on this cartoon. Uh, this is work by, uh, uh, in a review by my former mentor, Pierre Magistrati. Um, and, and there is this idea in the literature that essentially um, astrocytes take up glucose from the vasculature, which is necessary to produce ATP eventually. Um, but instead of uh, degrading this ATP and uh, uh, burning it into their mitochondria, they convert it into lactate and shuttle it to neurons, which then use it um, to, in their mitochondria to produce ATP, which they need, of course, because they are the cells that uh, consume most of the energy in the brain. And um, uh, many years ago, Luc Pellerin and Pierre Magistretti came up with this uh, idea that this mechanism or this, this mediation of uh, um, energy neuronal energy metabolism is uh, actually driven by glutamate uptake at uh, glutamatergic synapses. And this is what you can, you can see here on this cartoon. So uh, imagine you have some glutamate being released at the excitatory synapse. Uh, we have heard already before in that workshop that uh, uh, it's in the astrocytes siphon away these glutamates to prevent uh, uh, continuous excitation of the synapse and excitotoxicity. And this is being driven by the sodium gradient, which then activates um, the sodium pump, sodium potassium ATPS pump in astrocytes, and this drives the uptake of glucose from the vasculature. And basically, uh, astrocytes see that as a, or at least that's the theory, they see that as a signal 
uh, to basically take up glucose from the vasculature because they, they now know that uh, there's going to be a lot of neuronal activity in the in their local network. And so they need to provide lactates to the neurons as a substrate to, to produce energy. Um, so this is, this is an idea that has been rather controversial for a number of years. But uh, I don't have time to go into all the details of that controversy. If you are interested, I can, I'm happy to answer questions after that. Um, but I think there are good uh, structural and uh, biochemical reasons to think that this is actually how it works. Uh, and it has been uh, demonstrated, I, I would think, rather convincingly in a number of settings now. And I'm happy to discuss this uh, later if you, if you want. Um, so we have this, uh, this basically uh, uh, connection, uh, metabolic connection between neurons, astrocytes, and the vasculature. And um, so eventually we are interested in, uh, or this is uh, our, our, our main interest initially was to develop a computational model of that, or rather I would say a kinetic model of these uh, metabolic interactions. Um, so here, unfortunately, so you, you can see if you're not familiar with metabolism in mammalian cells, uh, you can see here a number of uh, metabolic pathways that are indicated, uh, but it remains at a cartoonishly simple level because uh, in fact, if you look at the uh, network of metabolic reactions in the mammalian cells, it looks more like this. Um, so it's an, an extensive, it's a, an extremely complex network of reactions. There are many so-called hub molecules, which are uh, actually play a role in a vast number of reactions. So as you can imagine, this is incredibly difficult to uh, make a model of, especially a kinetic model. So there are techniques to uh, try to figure out how these networks function uh, in, in static non-dynamic models, uh, but this is not what we were interested in here. And in fact, for the brain tissue, I would argue that there's a, an additional complication, which is that we are not looking at um, the energy metabolism or metabolism of a homogeneous block of uh, tissue or homogeneous tissue. But in fact, you have uh, different cell types that um, basically have essentially most of the same uh, or at least very similar cellular machinery, but that might be tuned to rather different tasks. Um, for instance, neurons might, uh, might uh, adjust their energy metabolism to uh, a different to, for different outcomes than glial cells do. And so you have this uh, massively redundant network from, let's say, a mathematical point of view. Um, but uh, and it might be hard to make a distinction between uh, who exactly is doing what. Okay. So nevertheless, uh, we uh, tried to uh, develop a, a, a much um, a much simplified version of uh, this uh, metabolic network and interactions. Um, and, and before we embark on that, I just want to show you this to, to give you a sense of the problem. Uh, at, that is, uh, this is typical experimental data that is available from the literature. So it's an in vivo recording with a probe of the extracellular lactate concentration in, in the motor cortex of a rat uh, that receives a, an electrical shock. Um, uh, so it's electrical four post stimulation. And so you can see, first of all, that uh, energy metabolism is an extremely slow process because these transients occur over several minutes. So it's a completely different time scale that any kind of neural or gliotransmission, for instance. Um, and also there isn't much, uh, let's say, complexity in, in that curve uh, that would uh, allow you to extract you know, a lot of information uh, from, from this. So, so, and I think it's uh, probably one of the reasons why um, this field that's, has, has, has been at sometimes uh, rather controversial because you, you don't, the experimental data might not be very conclusive uh, when you try to really understand uh, ex exactly what, what uh, different cell types do uh, differently. Um, all right. So we build a model um, and uh, the model looks like this. So it's about 30 plus uh, uh, differential equations. You, you can, I don't expect you to, to read all of that, uh, but basically describes uh, some of the essential steps. It takes, uh, as you can imagine, a, a number, it ignores a vast number of reactions and takes a number of shortcuts uh, out of necessity. Um, it's a bit of a Frankenstein monster model because it was uh, pieced together by assembling uh, models that existed for different organisms or systems where we basically recovered the equations from, from these other publications and kind of connected all of them together. And to give you a sense of how it looks like, uh, we have essentially four uh, 
let's say, compartments. We have a compartment for a neural compartment, a glial compartment, a vascular compartment, and the extracellular space through which uh, these cells exchange metabolites. Um, we also make a distinction uh, in the neuronal and glial compartments between the cytosol and mitochondria for a reason that is going to become clear in a minute. Um, okay, so um, the model is driven by two inputs. One is presynaptic activity, uh, and the other one uh, that we treat as a separate and independent input is basically uh, the, the regulation of the blood flow for in vivo scenarios. And this is because, of course, blood flow is regulated uh, locally in the brain um, um, by a number of pathways that, uh, that are activated locally. But the problem is that if you are familiar with this literature, you will know that there is a vast number of pathways that have been described and it's a bit of a mess. So there is not, a, there is not yet experimentally, as far as I know, a conclusive answer as to exactly how the regulation of blood flow is operated. And so it was simpler to treat that for us as a completely separate input to avoid to have to model a vast number of additional uh, uh, reactions. Um, and, and anyway, we would be on a somewhat experimentally shaky ground because uh, the, liter the experimental literature is evolving still uh, quite rapidly in that field. Okay, so that leaves up. So, so this is just to, to show you um, the, basically the, the, the fluxes that we are uh, using. And so that leaves you, as you can imagine, uh, even though the model is much more simplified, uh, much simplified with, with when you compare it to the to the biological reality, that leaves us with a vast number of parameters. Uh, some of them you can uh, find in the literature, but a lot of them you just cannot, um, simply because there is, you know, they've not been uh, experimentally measured or um, there is no uh, simple mapping you can use between experimental data and the kind of uh, non-dimensional or adimensional model that we are building here. And so we ended up uh, having to uh, calibrate the model by fitting it on experimental data. I don't want to go into the details because it's rather tedious and boring, but if you there's a trick to reduce uh, vastly the number of parameters that you are actually fitting um, that we used. So I'm happy to explain how we did that, uh, but I, I won't go into the details now. Um, and so the experimental data that we fit this model on is this uh, paper by Kazishke uh, et al. that was published in Science, where they measured um, NADH transients, which are an important molecule for energy metabolism. Uh, NADH transients, they measured that using two photomicroscopy in hippocampal slices, and they were able to distinguish between um, astrocytes and neurons, uh, but they were also able to distinguish between the cytosol of these cells and mitochondria. So it's one of the few papers where you have cellular and even subcellular uh, resolution in the experimental data that allows you to make a distinction between these different, uh, let's say, compartments within the tissue. And uh, so what we did is to basically fit the behavior of the model on that. Um, and you can see here that what they basically observed is that NADH is going down into dendrites or neurons uh, upon activation, that's the green curve, and there is a delayed overshoot in, in astrocytes. Um, okay, so we um, fit the behavior of our model onto this data. Uh, the data here, experimental data is the dotted line. So we have a relatively decent reproduction of this experimental data. And what does it predict? It predicts that you will, upon activation, you will have a massive increase of uh, oxygen consumption in neurons, which makes sense because they, they, uh, there's a lot of transmembrane currents. And so they need to pump ions out of their uh, or in or out of, their, uh, of the cell. And this activates the sodium potassium ATPase pump, which consumes ATP. And so they need to produce ATP by oxidizing uh, uh, glucose derivatives, basically. Um, there's a mild increase of glucose consumption in neurons. And, and there's a delayed massive increase in, in glucose consumption by astrocytes. So this seems to match this idea of this uh, astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle. So this mediation of uh, uh, glucose or transfer of metabolites from the vasculature to neurons via astrocytes. And if you look at the, the transfer of lactate at the membrane, what we see is essentially that astrocytes are uh, normally continuously exporting lactate to the extracellular space that is taken up by neurons, um, and that this is increased uh, during, during activation. And if you look at the lactate, lactate concentration into the tissue, you see this biphasic transient, which is uh, what we kind of expected based on experimental data I'm going to show in a minute. Um, so I should say that this is not a 
computational demonstration that is like the shuttle is actually uh, exists and functions that way, uh, because this is mostly determined by how you set up the model. Um, and in that case, uh, the model is set up so that most of the oxygen is being in the, that is consumed in the tissue is being consumed by neurons, uh, which is um, um, what has been reported in the uh, uh, experimental literature. Uh, because they are the cells that consume most of the energy, while um, um, basically the, the glucose is most, mostly goes initially to astrocytes, uh, which is determined in great part by the fact that they, they ensheath the vasculature, and so the, the glucose has nowhere to go really uh, but through astrocytes initially. Um, okay, so we have a model that basically kind of uh, seems to have the behavior that we expect, so now we can what we can do is to try to compare uh, this, the, the predictions of this model in a, in a new scenario, which is basically um, an in vivo scenario. And we, we want to look at the um, oxygen lactate dynamic in rats. So this is data I just uh, showed before. So lactate concentration undergoes a biophysic transition when you stimulate in rodents. And, and the oxygen uh, pressure in the tissue uh, has a rather complicated dynamics that is not super clear to see here but I'm going to show you in a minute how it looks. So we, we now plug in the uh, blood flow that has been experimentally measured in, in, or the tr um, in, in rats as a separate input. Uh, we have a prediction, uh, this curve is a prediction of the uh, oxygen dynamics, and this curve is a prediction of the lactate transient into the tissue. And again, this lactate shuttle here. So now when we compare what happens uh, uh, in experiments, we, we actually have a relatively good qualitative prediction of the lactate transient here. And in the case of oxygen, it's a bit hard to see, but um, uh, indeed what the, uh, these people, uh, who and Wilson uh, recorded, uh, oh, I know, sorry, this, this is a paper by Hensis actually. The, what they recorded is the, this um, initial dip of oxygen concentration in the tissue that we predict. Uh, this is the inset in panel B. Uh, we also have this uh, post-stimulation undershoot of the oxygen concentration that is also predicted by our model correctly. So we have a pretty good qualitative description of what happens um, on data that wasn't used for the calibration of the model. And we can do the same uh, with human data. Um, so in that case, the blood flow looks more like a trapezoid uh, in humans. Uh, you see, this is a very long stimulation. So this is to compare with uh, experiments from, from Mengia and colleagues who uh, recorded the lactate concentration. They did report this initial undershoot and then this uh, uh, grows to a plateau. Um, we predict a, a relatively large increase of glucose consumption into the tissue that is mostly due to uh, astrocytes taking up a lot of glucose. Uh, directly from the vasculature, while we have a rather mild increase in oxygen uh, consumption, um, which is a weird thing because um, you would expect uh, that the, these increases are proportional so that all the glucose that is taken up from the vasculature is actually completely oxidized. But actually this matches, uh, this is just the oxygen glucose index is just the ratio of uh, oxygen to glucose consumption. And this is actually um, a known uh, in vivo feature uh, that is, uh, as of yet, uh, still in, in lack of uh, a convincing explanation, although Buxton has an interesting recent paper on that. Uh, but this has been a known feature for, for a number of years in, in the experimental literature. So here again, our model uh, makes a decent prediction of, of uh, what you would expect. Um, yeah, and then finally, you can make a prediction of the bold signal that you would record from such a volume. And it also matches a number of features that people have reported in the, in the experimental literature, like this uh, initial uh, quick transients at the onset and offset of the stimulation. Um, so we think we have a rather decent- uh, Sorry, Reno, it's yeah. time to wrap up. Yeah, sorry. Oops. Sorry. Um, damn it. Uh, yes, so we think we have a rather decent model um, with a, um, uh, yeah, a, a decent uh, a predictive capacity. So where do we go next from there? Uh, we can go to a fully resolved 3D multi-compartment model of neuron astrocytes or, or astrocyte, neuron astrocyte metabolic interactions, uh, which I'm gonna go through very quickly. This is the work of my friend, Corrado Cadi uh, at the University of Torino. So we are in the process of uh, trying to do that. And um, also one question, well, the uh, obvious question is what do we learn from what such a model? And um, in a paper that we, I hope we are going to submit very soon, 
we actually use a technique uh, from computational chemistry that is called computational singular perturbation, which allows us to decompose the activity of this model into uh, a number of uh, stereotypic or characteristic modes. And from that, you can actually identify exactly which metabolites and which reactions drives, drive the behavior of the system in different uh, periods uh, 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 during stimulation, but also in the post-stimulation um, period. And uh, hopefully this is going to be uh, uh, on a preprint server very soon, uh, but we have some interesting findings suggesting, for instance, that the, the, meta the, the metabolic, the, let's say the, the metabolic behavior of the brain tissue is mostly driven by the astrocytic compartments after uh, uh, initial phase during the uh, very short or very brief initial phase um, during the, the, at the onset of stimulation. And that will be it. I just want to say I have two postdoc positions if people are interested to work on two technological projects, um, these two. So uh, that involves computational modeling of, to some extent, uh, neuron astrocyte interactions. So uh, drop me an email or a message on LinkedIn or Twitter if you're interested. And this is my team, founding and collaborators. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you to you, Renaud. And so we can have a couple of questions for Renaud and then we can move on to the discussion, join discussion. Anyone question? Well, I think it's a very interesting model, the one that like you built, um, because like everyone used ATP in like disease models and everything. It's always mostly a parameter, but we do know that it's not a parameter. It is a, like a really complex machinery. Oh, we have a question from Max. So I guess you can mute, unmute yourself. So go ahead. Hi, that was really, Fascinating, so cool. Um, I just had a quick question um, because I know that in the context of inflammatory signaling that a lot of changes happen in, uh, in various aspects of metabolism. And so I was, I was curious because you motivated a lot of this discussion by this initial observation that there's this uh, operational principle of maximizing the information per energy basically. Um, as a, as like an optimization problem. And so I was wondering if there is um, any change in that operational principle that happens in the context of inflammatory changes to metabolic signaling that you can tease apart with this type of model. Um, that's a very good point. I don't know. I, I don't have a, a good answer for you. I mean, the, the, the data that I showed where we looked at um, let's see the, the ratio between information flow and energy consumption. Uh, we looked at that in slices um, and it's not super easy to, to, these are not super easy experiments to do uh, mostly because of, I mean, there are some uh, severe, I mean, not horrible, but there are some uh, uh, um, experimental constraints. So I, I think it would be hard to really say, and then, and, yeah, I don't really have a good answer for you, I have to say. Uh, I'm, so we only looked at physiological scenarios as long as physio uh, you consider a slice a physiological scenario, of course. Um, I, I'm not really aware of uh, big metabolic changes in inflammation. I think it's complicated. So, there, so I, I've worked on microglia, you know, immune cells in the brain. They have a completely mysterious uh, energy metabolism, for instance. So I think they are, they are I don't, uh, except of, uh, outside of teasing that, I don't know how else I can answer your question. It's an interesting point. I mean, there are clearly mechanisms in cells to um, adjust their behavior if they run out of ATP. For instance, there is a, a potassium channels that I believe are gated by ADP. So if you have a lot of, or yeah, if you have a lot of ADP that accumulates, um, they, I think they will, they, they will uh, hyperpolarize. So they, you would expect the neural activity to be reduced. There's also uh, uh, um, um, a regulatory factor that is activated by AMP in cells. And people have shown that if so, so if cells get depleted, their energy storage gets depleted, you know, they, there's a lot of, changes directly in the nucleus, but this is a, a lot of biochemistry, too much biochemistry for me. So I, I'm not quite sure uh, I can answer much better than that, sorry. 
Okay, thanks. So I'm gonna, um, Anup, are you ready for the common discussion? And while Anup switch on his camera, Carlos, you can ask your question. And since you have question for both the speaker. Okay, okay. So I will go for Renaud because it's the, the one that I have uh, yes. now in mind. So if I have two questions, the first one is, uh, do you incorporate in this model uh, changes in the blood flow, for instance, or maybe some kind of uh, yeah, modulation that the astrocyte can have on this uh, system? And the second is like a more curiosity that I always had. And is, uh, do you think that the temperature is a variable that must be taken in account when the neuron start like a firing a lot? And that is something that can change and modulate in some way all those reactions? Um, temperature can modulate reactions for sure because a lot of uh, enzymatic reactions or the activity a lot of uh, enzymes or even the, you know, I mean, the kinetic of channels, all, all of these things will be uh, dependent on temperature to some extent. I mean, it will depend uh, from, from uh, for each type of, I guess, channel or enzyme you're talking about. And they might be not so sensitive to a few degree changes, but uh, definitely for, you know, you would have to check one by one. Um, whether temperature changes when neurons are active, I think it's a really interesting question. I, and I know a lot of people are interested in that, It's big, but there is, there is no easy way to measure that as far mm -hmm. as I can tell, because, um, you know, I mean, if you, uh, if you do a craniotomy, for instance, people have measured that if you do a rather a simple preparation where you don't seal the craniotomy, uh, even if you seal it, just the fact of uh, opening the bone, the mm -hmm. tissue that is directly underneath is actually quite a bit colder than the physiological temperature. And so I think it's something, um, it's an intriguing question, mm -hmm. uh, again, to which I don't have a very good answer, but that I think is worth is investigating really, um, and it would be really worth investigating experimentally. Now to, to your uh, other question, yeah, so as I said, I mean, the regulation of blood flow in the brain is a, is a, is a bit of a mess because there is, a, if you look at the literature, you will see that there's a very large number of uh, biochemical pathways that have been described that play some role in the regulation of blood flow. But there's not a single pathway that, um, uh, that you can shut down and for instance, completely abolish neurovascular coupling. So at most, if you even if you shut all of them that have been relatively well identified, you still don't get a, a full abolition of neurovascular coupling. And so I think it remains quite mysterious uh, exactly how it is controlled. And also um, it could be that it is a massively redundant signaling system where you have multiple mm -hmm. pathways that signal uh, to the vasculature at the same time. And so I don't think this has been resolved experimentally uh, convincingly. So this is still being actively investigated. And so that's why in the model, what we do is that we treat, um, so we, we have a, a in vitro scenario where we basically don't have any blood flow. So we replace that with a kind of a steady state that would mimic uh, slice mm -hmm. conditions. Um, uh, and when we, when we want to look at in vivo, we, we treat the blood flow as a, a additional input and you take the basically the, the transient from the literature and then that avoids the problem of having to find out how blood flow would be regulated with the specific uh, synaptic inputs that you drive the system with if you see what i mean so you 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 avoid that complication of having to model the active regulation of neurovascular coupling um, which i think there's one paper in the literature pe where people have done some modeling that i know of but yeah i think it's a, it's a really difficult task for a modeler simply because the, the biology is not uh, fully resolved yet. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, and we have one more question from Gabriela. I'm gonna invite you to unmute. Or someone will do it before me. No, okay, you're mute. Okay, go on. Gabriela. Sorry. Yes, we hear you. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, finally, <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much, Leno. Uh, I'm actually from the field. So I worked with Daniela Calvetti uh, on metabolic models. Uh, so you mentioned before the brain hemodynamics. And I know that's a little bit of a tricky field. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so you said that you're checking your model on rats 
Yes, and, and humans. I mean, we basically um, mm. kind of tried to see what the model prediction would be uh, in these two in vivo scenarios, simply because the data was there. Yeah. It, it just be aware that like um, in the, so in mice and in rats, the, the increase in blood flow is actually opposite. Yeah. Opposite what? <laughs> Opposite, like in, I don't remember, I think in rats, it's the one that uh, it, it increases and in mice, it decreases. And it also, it's very depending to what type of anesthet anesthetic uh, you use. So it, if it's isoflurane, it's very, like it affects a lot um, the, the blood response. And I think also, according to the results that I know, the, the dip in the OGI index should be a little bit lower. I think it's at least 20% in the most recent papers. Okay. Uh, in, the, in the, in I, the I don't believe that neuromuscular coupling works uh, in opposite directions in, in different rodents. I think um, because, I mean, I've done experiments in rats and uh, in mice. And I mean, if you stimulate the brain area strong enough, you do get uh, upregulation of blood flow. Now, that being said, um, it needs you need to consider um, carefully what you are looking at because it is what it, what happens. What people have shown is that, um, uh, for instance, if you if you stimulate whiskers in in rodents, yeah. you will activate the barrel cortex, and but to an extent because the, the you have this network of capillaries, um, you you upregulate you transiently upregulate blood flow in uh, one specific region and some of the blood is actually being drawn from neighboring regions. So in, you, you actually have a spatially uh, biphasic response because you have an increase of blood flow in one region that can lead to a decrease of blood flow in peripheral regions. So um, uh, now I forgot her name, unfortunately, but there's someone uh, at, UCS, uh, at UCSD that was done a very nice experiments on that. So yeah, I mean, you, you, have, to be, uh, you have to carefully look um, you have to be careful about this. Now, the, the data that we used, uh, this is laser Doppler um, data that they, they just mm. met, you know, they stimulate the four pole, I think, and then they see this massively, there's a very strong response of blood flow. Um, and there was something else you mentioned, so blood flow. And the, the OGI. Ah, the OGI, yeah, OGI, possibly. I mean, the, you know, so, so I don't think our goal is to uh, reproduce uh, quantitatively um, all of the features that you observe, because I think realistically this is this is uh, uh, probably overfitting the model, right? Because you you if if you've uh, I've done a lot of uh, fitting by models to biological data, it's really hard to get all the features exactly uh, quantitatively uh, quantitatively correctly, right? So I think it's um, in the end you, you can be happy if your model um, kind of captures the the proper behavior or the, the correct qualitative behavior of the biological system uh, without adding too much complexity to it. Um, but yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I don't think that the, um, at least, you know, I mean, it cannot, it cannot be that it is that different. So the, the OGI data I was mentioning is from humans. Um, the, the relative increase in glucose and oxygen consumption uh, that we uh, predicted, they match the historical literature, so something like 10% increase in, in, um, in uh, mm -hmm. oxygen consumption and 40% increase in glucose consumption. But then I guess um, this might depend on which brain area and stimulation protocol you look at and stuff like that. So I think, I don't think you can, I, d I don't think it necessarily makes a lot of sense to try to model all of these differences if you capture qualitatively the, the, the proper behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for this nice discussion. Um, I just want to point out that there are questions in this course, so please, during this break or later, have a look at what's going on in Discord. And we'll see you back in at 20 past. So um, thanks, everybody, for this first session of the this second day. It's been beautiful for until now. So see you later.